Hello there, this is A.D. Robles, and you're listening to A.D. on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. Ah, yeah, I love iced tea. Iced tea is very, very good. Anyway, let me get started right away. Sorry I did not upload yesterday, but I was at a funeral, so I could not upload. But maybe we'll make up for it today. Maybe we won't. We'll see what happens. But before we begin... Let me just say this. If you have not considered doing so, please consider becoming a Fight, Laugh, Feast Network club member. Use the show code ROBLES. That is R-O-B-L-E-S. Use the show code ROBLES. That is R-O-B-L-E-S to let the boys know that you like this content the most on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. I can't imagine why anyone wouldn't like this content the absolute most on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. But I'm a little bit biased, all that kind of thing. Let's jump right into it today, though. What I wanted to do, there was a a montage, if you will. There was a montage released showing a lots of woke critical race theory, just kind of bad teaching at South coming out of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, led by the fearless leader Danny Aiken. Danny Aiken is one of the most woke of all the se- the seminary presidents. Um, they're all a little bit woke, but he's one of the most. And um, yeah, there's some troubling things going on at that seminary. I, I've worked with and for a lot of corporations over the years. And, you know, some companies are run very, very well. There's a lot of transparency, a lot of directness. Um, You always know where you stand with them. I love working with companies like that. But then there's also companies that are just super toxic, where it's just like very dysfunctional, lots of secret meetings and secret agendas always at play, like the mafia almost. And Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, at least from reports, sounds to me like one of the worst places to work ever. Like, it's just like you never know where people are coming from. There's like secret rules that are like not really written down anywhere, but they're like unspoken rules that you got to follow. And they they, they try to control your Facebook feed. You can't post that on Facebook and stuff like that. Just really, really like lame, just horrible. It sounds like a horrible place to work. That's my opinion, of course. But anyway, um, this guy, Scott Crawford, he used to work there, I guess, or maybe he still works there. I don't know. Um, But uh, he had a lot of very interesting things to say, very sad to see and all that kind of stuff. But um, he also shared a montage of uh, very poor teaching. And so I thought we'd have a little fun and go through some of this stuff. Uh, I think that you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, well, at least you'll be informed. Let's get started. And I will let their words speak. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, Thank you for watching. and. Grace and peace. To Amen, you. Scott, and and grace and peace to you as well. Um, he mentioned as part of the comments here that people are always like, "Oh, you took him out of context. You took him out of context." But then, if you ever ask, my, my strategy with people that say that is, oh, "Okay, great. What was the right context?" And if you ask even one question, they fold like 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 something that folds. <laughs> <laughs> it's never it's ne- it's just a thing that people say you took them out of context but they don't actually ever know what the heck they're talking about it's just it's almost like that scene in liar liar where he goes objection and he goes on what grounds and he just says because it's devastating in my case just this is just, just, just something you say when you've lost but anyway let's uh let's take these words uh out of context because i'm sure that's what they're gonna say and let's just talk about them this is uh this is some good stuff here let's get started White Christians uh, need to learn, above all things, I think, to be good listeners. Uh, Over the last several years, as I've tried to help build a culture for racial reconciliation and kingdom diversity, uh, which is a core value of Southeastern Seminary, uh, I've come to understand more and more that my perspective is not the perspective of um, my African-American brothers and sisters or my Hispanic brothers and sisters, my Asian brothers and sisters. Uh, they really do see uh, life differently. Uh, they're operating out of a different uh, paradigm, a different context mm-hmm. yeah. uh, that's very different than mine. And I didn't really realize that until I stopped talking uh, and began to listen. And so I think one of the things that white evangelicals <laughs> in particular have got to do is become better listeners. Uh, in addition to that, we've got to be willing to surrender power 
uh, which is again uh, not uh, indigenous to our nature. <laughs> I love this. I love this. So, so this is one of my favorite things. Uh, you know, why, why, why Christians? This is the the president of a prestigious seminary. Probably has a very good income. There's nothing wrong with making a good income. I'm just pointing out that this is a very powerful man in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he's sitting there. Why Christians need to need to give up power? And this is a big scam because it's like, dude, if you actually believe that, Danny you would give up your power. You see, that's the thing. They always say it's for other people, what other people that they have no control over. That's who should give up power. But the only person that you do have control over yourself, no, 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 that's not for me. I'm going to maintain my power. After all, I am the great Danny Aiken. I am, I've established the core value of racial diversity, kingdom diversity even. And it's like, it's a big scam. It's a big scam. Put your money where your mouth is. If you if you really think you need to divest of power, then divest of your power. As a matter of fact, uh, my bank account stands ready. I have a PayPal. I've got a cash app. Send me the cash because I don't have as much cash as you do, most likely. So why don't you send me some divest of your cash and give it to me? In fact, I'll even consider it reparation. You see what I'm saying? Like This is just preposterous. It's all a big scam. Like, you, white Christians need to divest. Okay, you divest. Why don't we start with you? Because you're the only one you have control over. It reminds me of the uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, where it's like it, it freed all the slaves in all the territories that we didn't control. <laughs> it's like it's just preposterous, obviously. But then you know, even more than that, it's like, well, white Christians need to learn how to listen more. Uh, it's that's so preposterous. Every Christian needs to learn how to listen more. When the Bible says, "Be slow to speak, quick to listen," that's talking to everybody. That's not just for white Christians. That's for Latino Christians. That's for black Christians. I know plenty of Latinos and blacks that have a hard time listening. This is a, this is a thing that's, that's true of humanity in general. And he's like, well, you know, but white Christians have this problem giving up power. Like that's, again, that's another thing that is, that is common to humanity. That's just something that's common to humanity. When, when, when Christ was telling his disciples that whoever would be first should be last, when he was showing them how to serve, you know, if I've washed your feet and I'm your Lord, then you should wash each other's feet. It wasn't like, depending on your ethnicity, though, like if you're one ethnicity, if you're white, like the worst ethnicity, then you really got to learn how to serve other people. But if you're black, like, maybe you still have to learn how to wash feet, but maybe not as much. Like, like this is so perverse. Like the whole thing is perverse and it's very condescending and it's very hypocritical and preposterous. I love it. It's one of my favorite scams. Danny Aiken is expert at this scam. Let's continue. Uh, as I often say, not only do we need to invite ethnic minorities uh, uh, into our uh, room and uh, to have a seat at the table, yeah, yeah. Uh, we even need to be willing to surrender leadership at the table if we're really going to make progress and really uh, help uh, our brothers and sisters understand we see them on an equal plane with ourselves. I love that. This you? is if you if you if you one of the things that you should also pay attention to with this kind of a presentation is notice who it puts squarely in the driver's seat. Who it puts squarely in the driver's seat, it's the powerful, the capable, the you know, uh, the very very learned white Christians. You see, if white Christians don't invite us uh, savages to the table, we'll never get to the table. So, so a savage like me will never get to the table unless the white powers uh, at B invite me in. But not only that, that's not enough. You see, the white powers at B not only need to invite a savage like myself to the table, but they also, if, 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 if they didn't act, you see, if, if Danny Aiken the Great didn't act, I, not only would I not be at the table, but once I got to the table, I would never be given a position of authority. I would never be able to have any authority. Nobody would take me seriously unless the great white power of Danny Aiken grants me the authority to lead the conversation at that table. Danny, I don't want your help. I don't want to be at that table. I, I've got my own thing going on, right? I don't need you to divest of power in order for me to get ahead. You see, I actually believe people are equal. I actually don't believe that I'm a backward savage. I actually believe that blacks and Latinos like myself are just as capable as whites. And what we need from people like you, Danny, is to just treat us like everybody else. We don't need special invitations. We don't need special divestions of power. We don't need special treatment. We would just like to be left alone and treated like everybody else. But to, a, to Danny Aiken, that's not enough. You see, he squarely puts whites in the driver's seat here. Unless whites act, we will never amount to anything. 
That's how it is in Danny Aiken's twisted worldview. I think that's pretty preposterous. I think it's perverse. And let's continue because it just gets better from here. You live in the middle of a place that is just overwhelmingly white. There's hardly any people of color where you live at all in your town. This is Matt Mullins. Matt Mullins, uh, I, we've done some videos on his content before. I guess he's like an English teacher or something like that. And here he is talking about interracial adoptions. This sounds like a harsh thing to say, but you probably should not adopt hmm. a non-white kid. And so here's Matt Mullins, definitely not racist in any way. He wants you to know that up front. If you're white, you probably shouldn't adopt a non-white kid. Because Matt Mullins said so. And did he? do you think he might have gotten that from the Bible? I can't imagine where he would have gotten that from the Bible. But let's hear him out because maybe he's got a good reason for saying that white people should not adopt non-white kids. As I, let me just say it again, so just in case you didn't hear that one. Here is a Southern Baptist professor saying white people should not adopt non-white kids. Uh, this goes back to that, that form that everyone's going to have to fill out at some point if you want to adopt. And we, we've talked with other couples about this, given our experience. And, you know, if you're going to move to the middle of some place where it's all white folks and you're filling out this adoption uh, checklist and it says, you know, what races are you open to? I think white folks struggle with guilt. They feel guilty. You know, if they say, well, I'm only going to check the box that says I'm open to adopting a white child. But <laughs> it would be much better for your kids if you are going to only be able to because of where you live, because of who your friends are, and because of what you can and can't change in your life. If you're going to raise kids like white kids, that's not bad. That's not wrong. That's not evil at all. But you should adopt white kids. Dr. Cohn... <laughs> You see, you see, according to the non-racist Matt Mullins, if you're going to raise your black kids as white kids, then you should just adopt white kids because you shouldn't raise black kids as white kids because that's evil. But if you have white kids and raise them as white kids, that's not evil. You see, if you're black, if you're going to be white and raise your black adopted sons as black people... I don't know what that exactly means exactly, but if you're going to do that, I don't know, maybe maybe they listen to, to, to Jay-Z when they're in the womb. I don't know what he's talking about. You have to ask him. He's the one who's definitely not racist. But if you're going to do that, then that's okay. If you're going to raise him as, as if you're going to have a Korean uh, a kid, as adopted kid, you have to raise him as a Korean, even if you don't know anything about Korea. You definitely still have to, unless, unless you're racist, because if you're racist, then you will adopt a black kid or a Korean kid and raise them as a white kid. You see, that's the racist thing. So uh, stick to your own kind, according to Matt Mullins, the non-racist professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. This is all nonsense, obviously. Like, <laughs> this is all nonsense. And it's not hypothetical for me. I actually have a uh, brother-in-law who is a Korean. And he was uh, adopted into a white family. And they raised him the way they raised all their kids. And he's totally fine with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with him. He's fine. Uh, obviously, there was no unrealistic expectations for his white family to, ad uh, to raise him as a Korean since they knew nothing about Korea. Well, I don't say nothing, but they, they, they weren't Korean, so they didn't know how to raise him as a Korean, whatever the heck that's supposed to mean. Um, Matt Mullins is, uh, is out of his mind. He, he's, he is a racist, and I think he is one of these guys that admits that. He's like, well, I'm a racist, you know, one of those kind of guys. Um, so I'm just going to take him at his word. You heard it here first. The racist, uh, 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 Matt Mullins, um, well, um, let, me, let me just say this. In my opinion, he appears to be very racist. Uh, on uh, on video and audio said that if you're white, stick to your own kind and only adopt white kids. That's nowhere in the Bible, but you know that's you know, racists typically don't get their stuff from the Bible. So let's continue. We've now got the great Doctor Walter Strickland, who I do quote in my upcoming book, Social Justice Pharisees. Um, I think this is a quotation about James Cone. James Cone is clinically insane and one of Walter Strickland's favorite theologians he opened my eyes to the fact that christ is trying to restore brokenness you know and he really had a, a focus on that brokenness as manifesting as oppression racially speaking dr cone really allowed me to see the a new 
vista, a new space, a new avenue to uh, allow the gospel to be made manifest. I think the evangelical will do well to hear the voice of Dr. Cohn in drawing us towards the, the, the reality <laughs> that the gospel, the resurrection of Christ, has implications for the here and now, but yet also making sure that we don't lose the uh, eternal in, in, uh, realities of the gospel. You could see uh, well, Walter Strickland is, Strickland is just googly-eyed. You could, you could hear the, the admiration, the respect, the, how shall I say, just, just awe that Walter Strickland holds Dr. James Cone in. In fact, uh, in the article that I was quoted in in the New York Times, they also quoted Walter Strickland about how he secretly teaches James Cone without mentioning him because he doesn't want to put a stumbling block in front of uh, someone that is on the way to accepting the gospel according to James Cone. Now, one second, I've got a little bit of a treat for you. Here in my hands is uh, my book. This is my book, and this is the proofs that they sent me. They've done the layouts, and they they send you like the uh, layout of the book so that you can see sort of what it's going to look like, and you can approve it, and all that kind of thing. Hold on a second. Let me find where I quote from the great James Cohen. All right. So here's my. Uh, I've got four pages here on James Cohen, the Godfather of the woke church. I'm going to read to you this section. This is the first time that I've read from my book on the air. And so I am looking forward to this. If you remember, Walter Strickland, a professor at uh, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, says that evangelicals would be wise to heed the gospel presentations of James Cone. James Cone is, is, has, has formed the warp and woof of Walter Strickland's kingdom diversity, Danny Aiken approved theology. Let me read to you the section in my upcoming book, Social Justice Pharisees, about James Cone. James Cone was a black liberation theologian who passed away in 2018. When he died, Jamar Tisby and many other woke church leaders waxed poetic about how much they owe to Cone's writings for their own ideas and beliefs. James Cone was a literal, capital H, heretic. He denied every single one of the fundamentals of the faith. An abject lack of forgiveness as a priority was a big part of that. In his highly acclaimed book, outlining the basics of his heretical faith, he spoke about the situation for blacks in America in the 1960s. Quote, Why appeals to wait and talk it over are irrelevant when children are dying and men and women are being tortured. We will not let Whitey cool this one with his pious love ethic, but we will seek to enhance our hostility, bringing it to its full manifestation. In the next section, Cone describes in more detail what this hostility includes. Quote, We have reached our limit of tolerance, and if it means death with dignity or life with humiliation, we will choose the former. And if that is the choice, we will take some honkies with us. At this point, you may be wondering why the crown jewel of woke theological thought sounds like he's more interested in revenge than he is forgiveness. James has a succinct answer to that. Quote, Black theology refuses to accept a God who is not identified totally with the goals of the black community. This means that any theological idea that is not advantageous to blacks and their interests can be rejected, even if it seems to be taught in the pages of the Bible. Does Christ say to love your, love your enemy? Well, that must be white Christ speaking, since black theology would teach that loving your oppressor is sin. Quote. Their sin is that of trying to, quote, understand their enslaver and to love him on his own terms. As the oppressed community recognize their situation in light of God's revelation, they know now that they should have killed him instead of loving him. James Cohn spoke prophetically to our times as well. Ever wonder why Woke Church downplays modern race riots? They didn't invent this. They got this from their favorite theologian. Black Christ affirms such things. Quote, To be a disciple of the Black Christ is to become black with him. Looting, burning, or the so-called destruction of white property are not primary concerns. 
such manners can only be decided by the oppressed themselves who are teaching, I'm sorry, who are seeking to develop their images of the black Christ. You say, how can this be? How, this is not what Christ taught or how he behaved. Is not Christ the example for those who bear his name to follow? You foolish white fundamentalist. Quote. We cannot use Jesus' behavior in the first century as a literal guide for our actions in the 20th century. To do so is to fall into the same trap that the fundamentalists are guilty of. It destroys the freedom of the Christian man, the freedom to make decisions without an ethical guide from Jesus. Still can't accept it? Maybe you follow the white Christ. Don't worry, he's on the list too. Quote, We need, what need do we have for a white Christ? when we are not white, but black. If Christ is white and not black, he is an oppressor and we must kill him. Yeah, so Walter Strickland thinks that listening to that guy, who's definitely clinically insane, would be something that uh, evangelicals should do because he understands the gospel better than you do. Yeah. You know, the gospel that, you know, uh, you should be killing your uh, white oppressors, take a bunch of honkies with you. Uh, you know, you should worship the black Christ who doesn't mind if you loot or burn down buildings, all that kind of stuff. Oh, and by the way, if, uh, if you think that Christ in the Bible says you shouldn't be violent in that way, well, that's a white Christ, and we're going to kill him too. That's James Cone for you, and that's the guy that Walter Strickland thinks is very helpful. Let's continue and see if there's anything else here that we can talk about. An African-American cannot thrive in a white evangelical space if that space is entrenched in white evangelical culture. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time before I hit the brick wall. You know, mm -hmm. All my assimilation and everything, I'm st somebody's still going to call me the N-word somewhere along the line. So yeah. because uh, because someone somewhere will eventually call him the N-word, then it's impossible for whites and blacks to worship together. You know what I mean? Like, un unless, unless, like, you do literally everything that they say that you should do, I don't know, maybe have hip-hop in the worship service, and I don't know, like, wh what is it that they want? They don't ever say, they just want you to do whatever they say. Um, then that means that you can't thrive because maybe someone... You know, when I was a kid, called me the N word, then I can't thrive in a white evangelical space because these two PhDs say so. It's all nonsense anyway. Um, let's stop there, but I think I should continue in this because this this gets juicier. This montage and Walter Strickland makes a number of appearances here. In fact, you can find uh, Walter Strickland in this um, video montage talking about how you really can't blame the race rioters. That's just you know you know burning down buildings and burning down businesses of your neighbor. That's just the voice of the oppressed. And it's funny because in this in this article or in my book rather, I, I, this is this comes from James Cone, his favorite theologian. Of course, he believes that. He's following after his teacher. His teacher is the heretic that was James Cone. Um, anyway, I just wanted to do that video before the weekend. I hope you found this podcast helpful, and I'll see you next week. God bless. Don't forget to tune in next week on Thursday for AD on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network.